number live in five, four, four three, two, one. Number 11. Good morning, everyone. My name is Clifford Pierre. I'm a neurosurgery fellow at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. And uh, we'd like to welcome you to our cerebrovascular question and answer symposium hosted by the Seattle Science Foundation. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Charles Matuk, uh, who is currently a dual trained cerebrovascular and vascular neurosurgeon uh, practicing at the Yale University School of Medicine. Um, he's the, the vice chair of the section of neurovascular surgery, as well as the director of the endovascular fellowship program. Um, and uh, since joining Yale in 2011, they have built a robust uh, practice uh, involving carotid revascularization, all three modalities, CEAs, TCAR, as well as transfemoral carotid artery st um, stents. Um, so to this morning, we'd like to have him uh, speak about the integration of TCAR into carotid revascularization practice. All right, I'm gonna, thanks so much for the kind introduction. And thanks for the uh, invitation to present. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let's start with that. All right, you guys can see that okay? Yeah. Yep, you're there. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, really just TCAR uh, broadly. Um, and uh, with an emphasis on how we've integrated it into our current carotid revascularization practice, our, our section performs about, I would say, um, 100 plus carotid revascularizations a year, um, over 90% of which are in symptomatic patients. So um, uh, we'll just sort of go through how, that's, how, how that, that practice has sort of evolved over time and how we've come to decide on which method of revascularization that we prefer in whatever situation. Um, I do have a number of disclosures um, that are listed on this slide, the most important of which is that I am a consultant and proctor for Silk Road Medical, which is the company that makes um, the, um, um, the en route sheath, right, so the TCAR system. Um, I also serve as the national PI for a modified um, uh, TCAR access system uh, specifically designed for acute stroke. Uh, for open uh, carotid access um, and a site PI for the Roadster 3 uh, trial, which is a post-approval study of the TCAR system in patients at standard uh, surgical risk. All right, so in terms of outline, we'll first start off by discussing, should I revascularize? And that will really emphasize the um, dichotomy of asymptomatic versus symptomatic carotid stenosis and how that's, I think, the fundamental branch point, um, especially when you're starting in practice about whether or not you're going to take on a case. Um, we're then going to talk about the options, and there's three currently, carotid endarterectomy or CEA, transfemoral carotid angioplasty and stenting, and that's CAS or CAS, and then the TCAR methodology, which stands for transcarotid arterial revascularization. We'll then put it all together and we'll talk about how I choose between the different methods currently and how that's evolved over time. And we'll end by discussing, um, you know, the future, which is, um, I think, TCAR is a platform technology that has applications well beyond uh, carotid revascularization per se. And I think currently you can have roles in your practice um, with uh, neuro interventions, broadly speaking. So just to level set for uh, the trainees um, in the audience, you know, carotid stenosis accounts for about 15% of strokes worldwide, uh, although there is some geographic variation. Uh, carotid stenosis refers to a narrowing of the carotid artery, typically at the level of the carotid bifurcation in the neck. Um, and um, although carotid atherosclerosis is by far the most common etiology for disease at that location, you should always just have in the back of your mind that there are other differentials that should be considered, things like carotid dissections, carotid webs have received a lot of attention re recently, and a variation of accelerated atherosclerosis called radiation-induced vasculopathy, and these all have slightly different nuances to their sort of like uh, ideal treatment strategy. 
Um, what you have over here on the left side is a typical um, atheromatous plaque that was resected at a carotid endarterectomy. This is the proximal end over here um, at the, the common carotid artery, and then you can see the branch into the external carotid artery, and then a branch into the internal carotid artery. And here you can see the atheromatous plaque is sort of a more bulbous appearing uh, area within that um, plaque tissue. So just to review again, historically, um, how we make decisions about carotid revascularization, there were some, just like in stroke nowadays, the foundational trials, there were foundational trials in carotid revascularization, particularly trials that compared best medical therapy at the time and carotid endarterectomy. And those trials accrued patients, they recruited or enrolled patients in the 1980s and mid-1990s. So it is, some, it is some time ago, but I think that um, it really does serve as the bedrock for how we make carotid revascularization decisions. So this is a very famous um, uh, figure from a paper that was published by Peter Rothwell uh, some time ago, and basically um, combined the three uh, pivotal studies or foundational studies at the time comparing carotid endarterectomy uh, versus best medical management. And what you have here on the y-axis is the absolute risk reduction of an ipsilateral ischemic stroke or any operative stroke or operative death over time. And what periods of time, it was done over three years, five years, and eight years. These different bins on the x-axis represent different percentage stenosis. So here on the left side of the graph on the x-axis, you have very low grade stenosis. And then that stenosis bin increases as you walk from left to right across the graphic. So over here, you have 80 to 89%, 90 to 99%, and then over here near occlusion. And anything basically above the zero mark represents um, something that's in favor of carotid endarterectomy. Anything below the zero line would be in favor of best medical therapy. So you can very quickly see that the air bars cross for low-grade stenosis, right? Even that 50 to 59% uh, grouping. And so the uh, benefit of uh, carotid revascularization, in particular carotid endarterectomy compared to best medical therapy is marginal in this population. And that's why we don't, that 50% that number for symptomatic carotid stenosis, all these patients, by the way, are symptomatic patients. In other words, that they've had either an episode of amaurosis, a TIA, or a non-disabling stroke. But if you have a less than 50% stenosis, then those patients probably don't warrant carotid revascularization based on these three foundational trials. And what you can also see is that as you increase the percentage stenosis, the relative benefit of the carotid endarterectomy procedure in terms of preventing an ipsilateral stroke increases linearly with the grade of stenosis. So in other words, that there's more benefit to revascularizing a 90 to 99% stenosis than there is to revascularizing a 60 to 69% stenosis. So I think that's also sort of important to, to recognize, and I guess maybe conceptually makes some sense. You can also see that with the bins, the bins are all sort of like raised equally, and these different columns represent um, the different periods of uh, time that the patient was followed, so either three, five, or eight years, so that benefit is sustained over a prolonged period of time. So this is like a really good, a really good procedure. And if we think of it in terms of number needed to treat, when you get over a 70% carotid stenosis, the number needed to treat to prevent an ipsilateral ischemic stroke is about six. And when you get into this moderate carotid stenosis range, it effectively doubles or a little bit more than doubles to now being about 15. But you are on solid ground if you decide to revascularize a greater than 60% certainly carotid stenosis that's symptomatic. And it's based on these foundational studies. Rothwell followed this paper up in another very beautiful paper published in The Lancet in 2004, where he looked at the relative benefit of carotid endarterectomy in those foundational, time, foundational trials, <clears throat> but looked specifically at the timing of carotid revascularization. So if you, if you look over here, again, on the y-axis is this absolute risk reduction. So the benefit essentially of carotid endarterectomy. And here on the x-axis, you have these bins 
uh, of time when the carotid endarterectomy was performed. Here it's from zero to two weeks, here it's two to four weeks, here it's four to 12 weeks, and here it's over three months. And what you can very nicely see is that for both moderate and for high-grade stenosis, the benefit of carotid revascularization falls the further out you get from the ictal stroke. So the ideal time to operate in terms of reducing, in other words, the most bang for the buck of reducing someone's risk of having a stroke is if you operate within the first two weeks. So you might have heard that in the neurosurgical literature. Certainly, I think that's true for most neurosurgeons that we tend to want to operate within two weeks, <clears throat> maybe not in the hyperacute setting. So we usually let things stabilize for 48 hours. So sometimes between the two day mark and the two week mark, depending on the size of the stroke, I think is the time when you would have the most benefit from a carotid revascularization procedure. You can see here that the air bars start to cross that zero absolute risk reduction line once you get out beyond three months. So if a patient has a symptomatic carotid and you're operating between three and six months out, you effectively have lost the benefit of the procedure and it is akin to operating on an asymptomatic carotid stenosis, if that makes any sense. So for people in the aneurysm world, because maybe we think about that a little bit more in neurosurgery, if you didn't treat a ruptured aneurysms for over six months, according to the cooperative study, the risk of that aneurysm rupturing would essentially assume the risk of an unruptured aneurysm at that point if you survived the initial rupture. So <clears throat> that's the story with symptomatic carotid disease. And I think that when you begin in training and you begin in your practice, um, you want to try to choose as best you can um, symptomatic carotid patients because the evidence is so clear that, and the benefit so great to performing a carotid revascularization in terms of secondary stroke prevention that you're just on very solid ground. Once you get into the asymptomatic carotid game, it's much more nuanced. And I think that the evidence is much um, uh, shakier. Um, this is a nice um, uh, graphic that was published some time ago by Markhart. Um, and what it essentially does is that it summarizes the recruitment time periods of patients into major clinical trials and registries. Um, that uh, enrolled patients with asymptomatic carotid stenosis. So these bars over here, these lines and these circles, circles represent the, the number of patients. So the bigger the circle, the more number of patients and the lines that run through the circle represent the period of enrollment of that patient or of patients into that particular study. So for example, here you have ECST, the Veterans Affairs Trial. You can see NASIT up here. NASIT only enrolled symptomatic carotid stenosis, but it turns out that we have two, and you could have a contralateral carotid stenosis that was asymptomatic, so those patients were followed in the asymptomatic arm of that particular study. Um, all the way over to the most recent enrollment in the Oxford Vascular Registry, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. So again, recruit over time. This Norris study is a famous study from Toronto where, where I trained. Here you have um, average annual risk rate of having a stroke, right? And it's from zero to 4% annual risk. And you can see, I think in general, that the risk over time of an asymptomatic carotid stenosis resulting in an ipsilateral stroke has essentially fallen sort of over time over these periods of enrollment. And if you go all the way to the Oxford Vascular Registry, which was a very sort of like highly controlled patient population where people had like, um, you know, coaches to make sure that they were um, abiding by, you know, doctor's instructions and risk factor modification, and they were staying on an aspirin and being on a stat and all these types of things, that the stroke risk can fall to as low as 0.34% per year. I often give the analogy that I can't change a hundred light bulbs in a row without breaking one, right? And so in the risk of a problem, the natural history is so low, right? You just have to be wary of any type of intervention on a blood vessel that's supplying the brain. So um, I tend to, to be uh, relatively conservative in my management of asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Here, just to give you that number needed to treat feel for things, um, the number needed to treat is uh, 19 to prevent one stroke in 10 years, right? So we're talking about, um, you know, relatively small 
relative reductions in stroke risk, relatively small absolute reductions in stroke risk. And so when you're starting in practice again, and you're just getting familiar with the different carotid revascularization strategies as an independent practitioner, you know, maybe asymptomatic carotid disease isn't like the place to start, if at all possible, right? So the first question is, you know, is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic? If they're asymptomatic, just be careful. In my practice, I tend to operate on patients with asymptomatic carotid disease if they have a high-grade stenosis that's greater than 80%, if they're men, if they're relatively young, if they have a contralateral carotid occlusion, if they're about to undergo a high-risk uh, procedure like cardiac surgery, where there could be you know episodes of hypotension, I'd look at the circle of Willis to determine if they have a more vulnerable circulation uh, and that carotid revascularization then may be a benefit, maybe high risk plaque features, things like that. But in general, I'm not super enthusiastic about um, uh, treating patients with asymptomatic carotid disease, regardless of the modality. When you talk about symptomatic carotid disease, if you're greater than or equal to 50%, you're pretty much on solid ground based on the foundational trials, most bang for your buck. It's a great place to get started uh, in terms of um, you know honing your still your skills uh, with carotid revascularization. If it's less than fifty percent, according to the foundational studies, there's little or no benefit. But there is emerging literature in this regard, and um, just from this graphic, you can see that the percentage stenosis um, is really not a great proxy for how much plaque you have at the bifurcation. So all these different carotid configurations have exactly the same percentage stenosis, but you can see that the volume of plaque or the nature of the plaque, right, in terms of like, for example, in this right-sided figure, here's like a little bit of intraplaque hemorrhage, is not going to be reflected in the percentage stenosis. But there's an emerging literature that these things are important in terms of determining the patient's risk of having a stroke and therefore probably the benefit of carotid revascularization in these, in these uh, patients. So the foundational studies were performed sort of before CTA was commonplace. It was based on diagnostic catheter angiography. What we could measure was percentage stenosis, but the field has evolved with cross-sectional imaging so that we can have a much better understanding of at-risk plaque features and other features that might maybe sway us to operate. So this, for example, would be a patient that doesn't have any carotid stenosis, but has like a large ulceration and maybe plaque hemorrhage in that ulcer. And I have to think that that patient would be at higher than average risk of having a stroke. So this is the concept of the vulnerable plaque. And if you have a patient, especially a patient that's having recurrent strokes in that same downstream territory, and they have one of these high risk, less than 50% stenoses, in our practice, we tend to revascularize those um, using the common sense principle, even though the evidence to do so um, is, is limited at this time. This is a great example of vessel wall imaging from uh, a paper, or it's actually, I think, guidelines that we, a white paper that we wrote with Bruce Wasserman um, and the group at the University of Washington, looking at vessel wall imaging that very nicely can identify patients that have um, uh, intraplaque hemorrhage, which is a known high risk feature for recurrent strokes. So on a CT scan, you would see that as a hypodensity within the CTA, it would look hypodense. Uh, a lipid necrotic core will also look um, uh, hypodense. You can't distinguish on a, on a CTA between a lipid-rich necrotic core versus an intraplaque hemorrhage. But from a clinical point of view, um, that hypodensity, whether it represents lipid or hemorrhage, uh, probably puts you at even higher risk for having a recurrent stroke. And so this can help sway your decision, especially if you're dealing with a patient with a less than 50% stenosis. Uh, this is one such example of a patient that looks like they have some intraluminal thrombus that didn't resorb after a few days of being on heparin, had this elongated styloid process, for example, that we think was irritating this area of the internal carotid artery or common carotid artery um, when uh, the patient turned his neck. This patient had recurrent strokes, and we ended up um, uh, doing an endarterectomy to remove this um, after the plaque was stabilized after a few days on heparin and also at the same time removing the styloid process. And this person, for example, now hasn't had recurrent strokes in many years, even though she'd had multiple recurrent strokes leading up to this. So just to remember to always sort of like uh, think outside the box, I think evidence is super important. 
Um, uh, but, you know, we only have evidence for so much. And so what we teach our residents here is that you have to know the evidence, but I'd much rather you be a principle-based surgeon in terms of your decision-making than an evidence-based surgeon, because you don't want the evidence to hold you back from making reasonable decisions for your patients. We're going to that was to sort of like level set. So that's like my general thinking about carotid revascularization in general, independent of the technique. And um, just as um, a teaser, and we're gonna go through this case a little bit later uh, in the talk, um, I'm gonna introduce this patient. So, um, and we're gonna talk about um, how we think about carotid revascularization now, and then how we think about carotid revascularization after we've talked about all the different modalities. So. 69-year-old um, uh, patient comes in with uh, classical cardiovascular risk factors and presents with acute onset left lower extremity weakness while cooking dinner for her family. Uh, her family loves her, and so they bring her to the hospital and in a timely fashion. And she's seen in the emergency room, and they get a plain CAT scan. And the, the plain CAT scan shows that you know, maybe there's like this old stroke on the left side. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, but there's no vessel occlusion on the CTA. They administer IVTPA. Uh, and then as part of her stroke workup, she gets an MRI, which shows this new acute stroke, um, which is uh, concordant with her presentation. The stroke workup also includes a CTA. And on the CTA, you can get a lot of information. So there's like a little ulceration in the common carotid artery. You can see there's a component of soft plaque, component of hard plaque. You can see that there's an origin stenosis, probably because of extension of the atherosclerotic disease uh, into the origin of the external carotid artery. You can see that there's a prominent bend and harsh kink in the internal carotid artery below the skull base, which might have implications if you're landing a distal embolic protection device. Um, the CTA also gives you a very nice um, um, overview of the arch anatomy, the course of the common carotid arteries, the relative medialization of the internal relative to the external carotid artery, how high that lesion is up in the neck. It importantly tells you about the circle of Willis, which we're gonna spend some time talking about later. And so it really gives you like a ton of information about how you might begin to choose between the different modalities of carotid revascularization if that's what you decide this person needs. And I'll say that on cross-sectional axial imaging, the stenosis was at about 80%. So we're going to come back to that um, at the end of the next section or two sections, and we're going to talk about how, you know, what we did and how we made that decision. Um, so now let's discuss the options. So um, I have no uh, relationship to Chris Loftus. I've never met Chris Loftus. Um, this is the best carotid surgery book I've ever seen. Um, and I, I still have it on my shelf and I still refer to it. It is a, a brilliant, um, in my opinion, um, uh, just compendium of difficult cases, standard cases, very well illustrated. Um, and it really takes you step by step through different variations by a very experienced carotid surgeon. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, it's an older book, but um, I think it's is well worth um, well worth the read. The uh, to understand, I think, the relative uh, merits and efficiencies of the different surgical procedures, um, you have to sort of understand how the how the procedure you know is done. So the, the first thing is you know the carotid endarterectomy. Um, 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 you know, involves essentially um, um, exposing the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So that's that's over that's this picture over here. You can see this is the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and you see it essentially after you cut through the platysma. And so this incision line uh, is basically extending along that anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, all the way up to the mastoid process, almost behind the ear, although it's very rare that we extend the incision up quite that far. Um, to get a nice exposure, it's important to recognize that the internal carotid artery is situated normally lateral to the external carotid artery, right? So on my right side, if this is the internal carotid artery and this is the external carotid artery, when I turn my neck, Right, it brings the internal carotid artery up into the surgical field. That makes life nice for the surgeon because that's the structure that we're operating on. As we get older and our blood vessels become twisted, 
um, you can get what's called medialization of the internal carotid artery. And so that the blood, ve the blood vessel essentially turns. And so now the internal carotid artery is located deep in the surgical field when you turn the neck and it's actually driven further away from you. And it drags the external carotid artery branches over that medialized internal carotid artery. Now you can handle this and you can actually take all the external branches. And we do that sometimes if you want to get a nice exposure for a difficult case, it does increase the complexity of the procedure somewhat. And it should be a factor that you look at when deciding whether or not you want to sort of partake in an endarterectomy. After you expose the sternocleidomastoid muscle, what you're going to look for is the internal jugular vein. And the internal jugular vein is typically tethered medially to the medial structures by this common facial vein. This common facial vein has to be isolated and then uh, cut, so skeletonized and cut, allowing you to retract the internal jugular vein uh, laterally. That will then expose the carotid tree. And um, once you get the carotid tree, you start with a common carotid artery and you get control. You get control of the superior thyroid artery and the branches of the external carotid artery. And then, um, uh, you know, you get, you know, you expose the internal carotid artery above the plaque. And so this gives you now control of uh, the vessel that you're going to be opening up so that when you open the blood vessel, you're not going to get a lot of, um, you know, bleeding and making the endarterectomy that much more difficult. So part of this, because we're going to be clamping and we're going to talk about that in a minute, you are depending a little bit on the circle of Willis to make sure that there is good collateral supply while you've arrested essentially anti-grade flow to that part of the brain, unless you're going to decide to use a shunt. All right. So um, let me just pause this because it's noisy. So this is what it looks like in real life. Here's the internal carotid artery, the external carotid artery. This is the hypoglossal nerve. And the hypoglossal nerve generally sits about a centimeter and a half above the carotid bifurcation under the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. So the posterior belly of the digastric muscle is a good uh, clue that you're going to come across the hypoglossal nerve. It just sits under that belly. And so uh, it, it's a very good landmark because you don't want to damage that nerve. It will create an ipsilateral uh, tongue palsy. Again, because the tongue is located medially and we're operating on the carotid artery, which is situated laterally, the uh, safest place to dissect when you're going distally in the field or cranially is on the lateral side of the internal carotid artery, because then for sure you won't bump into the hypoglossal nerve, which runs from medial to the bifurcation or about a centimeter and a half above the bifurcation, and then goes straight up along the internal carotid artery, just a little bit above it, all the way to the skull base in the hypoglossal canal. One of the nice advantages of carotid endarterectomy is that you remove the plaque completely. I generally don't use a patch except in uh, women that have smaller blood vessels. And this is a very good example of that hemorrhagic plaque, which is typical of symptomatic carotid stenosis. Almost all the serious problems like stroke that occur after carotid endarterectomy, in my opinion, occur because of one of two reasons. One is that the patient doesn't have a circle of Willis. For example, you're isolating on a patient with an isolated circulation. And so any amount of cross clapping is gonna cause some ischemic time, whether you put a shunt in or not, right? So there's a difference between putting a shunt in everybody or selectively and needing a shunt. And so that is determined essentially on your cross-sectional imaging, the CTA, about is there a circle of Willis that's present? And if you have a patient that really doesn't have an ACOM or a PCOM and it really looks like an isolated circulation, um, like there's no A1, for example, on that side, I would probably not choose carotid endarterectomy as my first line treatment strategy. The next issue beyond that in terms of circle of Willis is the distal end of the endarterectomy up here. It's the part that's the tightest, the most crowded. It's where the vessel is the smallest. And any amount of plaque dissection, right, which occurs at the distal end of the endarterectomy, which is not removed, creates the potential for a dissection flap. And what happens with this dissection flap is that because blood flow, unlike the femoral artery where the blood flow is coming down and tacks a dissection down, here blood flow is going this way. And so it'll pull that dissection up and crowd the true lumen. And you can get now an occlusion at the distal end of the endarterectomy, either acutely or over time. So managing this distal end of the endarterectomy becomes fundamental um, to being able to perform this procedure safely.
And so if you have a very high bifurcation or for whatever reason, you can't get high enough up in the neck to ensure that you have good control of the vessel and you can see it and tie it down well and have a nice dissection or a, a nice uh, plaque removal without a dissection plane, uh, that incrementally increases the risk, in my opinion, of doing endarterectomy. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, transfemoral stenting. I'm going to save the sort of history of transfemoral stenting a little bit just for the sake of time. But we are going to talk a little bit about what the procedure involves. So the first thing that's involved is that you have to travel from the femoral artery all the way up to um, the common carotid artery below the level of the stenosis. And to do that, these are sort of heavier systems and heavier catheter systems. You often can't get enough purchase in the CCA alone to get your catheter, your base catheter construct up. So you need to cannulate the external carotid artery uh, to have enough purchase or to perform an exchange to get your base construct up into the CCA safely without crossing the stenosis. So difficulties with the arch or with being able with the ECA origin, like we talked about a little bit in that case, become important things to consider when you're considering a transfemoral approach. The next is that there's a conceptual problem with transfemoral stenting in that you have to cross this lesion once unprotected, right? With a wire that houses the distal embolic protection device on its end. And that is inherently an at-risk procedure. Now we do this all the time and we don't have a problem, but what we're talking about carotid revascularization, we're really talking about 1%, 2%, 3% complication rates. And so if you're going from 3% from 1%, well, that's effectively more than doubled, right? It's like triple the rate of complication. So that is an inherent, I think, vulnerability of the procedure. You also have to have a nice straight segment for the distal embolic protection device to land. And so if there's excessive tortuosity at the skull base, that might cause problems in terms of where you land the distal embolic protection device. You then perform the angioplasty and stenting procedure and then you have to retrieve the device. The retrieval of the device can be such a problem, right? And I'm sure anybody that's done transfemoral stenting has had to get creative about uh, crossing, for example, with the recapture device, um, the stent, um, the device can get stuck, the recapture device can get stuck in the tines of the stent, uh, which then pulls the distal embolic protection down potentially. It can get bumped during the recapture, which spills some of the contents of the embolic protection, um, uh, you know, of some of the embolic debris that's housed within the um, uh, embolic protection device at the, at the end of the procedure. And those will all travel up with uh, blood flow into the brain. And so, in my opinion, the, the access at the beginning and the recapturing of the device at the end represent the two most vulnerable times where you can have like a relatively big complication. Uh, in in terms of carotid angioplasty uh, and stenting. But there's a major benefit. And the major benefit is that of all the procedures, it's the only one where the circle of loss doesn't matter, right? You have continuous integrated flow. And I think that is a, a major benefit of carotid stenting procedures. All right. This is um, a figure that we had made for an upcoming review on TCAR. And this is the TCAR procedure, essentially. Um, it basically involves putting an arterial sheath into the common carotid artery well below the area of the disease, right? So it's the disease is up here in the neck. This is here right down just above the clavicle. And so a nice thing is that you're not actually manipulating the disease segment of the vessel at all during a TCAR procedure, which you are, for example, during a carotid endorectomy procedure. This arterial sheath is then connected to a line and in the middle of that line is a filter and then connected to an eight French venous sheath in the leg. And so if you clamp the carotid artery below um, uh, where you put the arterial sheath in, you basically arrest integrate flow. And if you open the circuit, you now create a high pressure arterial to low pressure venous shunt. If a patient has some circle of Willis, right? That will cause reversal of flow in the carotid artery. And that is a very effective neuroprotection strategy, as it turns out, um, in terms of um, uh, uh, doing an angioplasty and stenting procedure, um, you know, without having to place a distal embolic protection device. And so um, it, it has like this major advantage uh, because you don't have to put a distal embolic protection device. You don't have to worry about crossing the lesion unprotected. You don't have to worry about any distal uh, um, uh, tortuosity 
um, in the internal carotid artery at the skull base in terms of landing the distal embolic uh, protection device in a straight segment. And it also turns out to be a very robust and effective uh, strategy in terms of controlling the emboli that pass into the brain. This is, of course, dependent on the need for some circle of Willis, right? So again, if you have a patient with an isolated circulation, it's probably not the best patient for a T-car because the blood has to come from somewhere in terms of the flow reversal, which is fundamentally the, 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 uh, um, the protection strategy that's used here. Now, we published um, in JNIS, um, I think last year, um, a short technical video. I'd encourage you, we took a lot of time sort of doing this. Um, at this point, we've probably done close to maybe 150 TCAR procedures. And, um, um, you know, some of the tips and nuances that we learned over time. I'll play like a short uh, part of the video, but we're not going to go through it all for the sake of time. So I'm just going to let this play Andrew, for a second. The TCAR procedure can be performed under general anesthesia or monitored anesthesia care. In our shop, general anesthesia is preferred and helpful when you're getting up and running with the technique. Ask your anesthesiologist to position the endotracheal tube off to one side, away from the surgical field. Ideally, the blood pressure should be maintained at about the patient's pre-induction baseline. A good rule of thumb is maintaining a systolic blood pressure between 140 and 160. In our shop, the TCAR procedure is performed in a hybrid neurovascular operating room. A uniplane machine will suffice, however. Similar to carotid endarterectomy, a small bolster is placed under the patient's shoulders to facilitate neck extension and the head turned to the contralateral side. Do you see that little groove? And this is sort of like the key to the procedure, in my opinion, is identifying that groove, which occurs over the medial um, um, superior border of the clavicle. And I actually draw my incision on the superior border of the clavicle between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. That is a natural avascular plane uh, to the internal jugular vein and uh, common carotid artery and vagus nerve. So that identifying that corridor is the sort of critical step of the procedure. And that's the part I think that for neurosurgeons probably takes the longest time to learn is just getting comfortable with exposing the common carotid artery in that triangle. And, and it's not so much even the dissection, it's the, identific it's the identification of the triangle. It just takes maybe like five to 10 cases to just understand what it looks like when you're in surgery. Once you understand what it looks like, uh, identifying that, that avascular plane becomes uh, much easier and it makes the procedure in terms of the surgical part trivial. An ultrasound can be performed to mark that it was the right groin for company five wide, so, lifted off in um, the automastoid muscle or SCM. In most patients, a triangular depression can be visualized and palpated at this location. The skin is infiltrated with 1% lidocaine and epinephrine. The skin and platysma are cut sharply with a number 10 blade. At this point, the two heads of the SCM may not be readily apparent. They are still covered by subcutaneous tissues. An avascular plane is developed below these soft tissues, which are then divided. Now the two heads of the SCM should be visible. To increase their conspicuity, a ray tech or sponge can be used to gently massage the tissues. These maneuvers greatly facilitate identification of the surgical plane between the two heads of the SCM. That move is like, for me, was like critical. Uh, what you often just see is that you won't see the depression of the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, but if you push down on the planes um, with, with, a, with a four by four, with a ray tech, with a sponge, um, some of that um, extra uh, subcutaneous tissue will get flattened and you'll see the contours of the two heads. Now you know where to go and it makes the procedure so much easier. That move, in my opinion, is the cornerstone to, to this operation in terms of the surgical exposure. Using primarily blunt dissection, the surgical plane between the two heads of the SCM is developed. The internal jugular vein is identified, its medial border skeletonized, and the vessel retracted laterally. Care must be taken not to be over-aggressive when mobilizing the internal jugular vein, which sometimes requires the division of small crossing veins. These can produce pesky bleeding if false. With the internal jugular vein retracted laterally, the CCA and often the vagus nerve are visualized. The CCA is mobilized circumferentially and secured using a double loop umbilical tape, being careful not to include the vagus nerve. I strongly recommend the use of an umbilical tape over standard vessel loops as the increased friction with the vessel wall will facilitate manipulation of the vessel during the next steps of the procedure. 
I'm just going to stop there as the well and just um, just emphasize this idea that um, um, uh, how mobile and how hard you can pull on the carotid artery is a bit jarring when you first get started with the operation, but you can really pull the carotid artery out of the surgical field pretty far, um, you know, with impunity and not incur a vessel injury. Again, this is the non-diseased part of the vessel. Uh, well below the atheromatous lesion that you're going to be tackling and targeting. So I'm going to not go through the rest of that video, but this was one of our first cases. Uh, so it's a little bit of a bigger exposure. Uh, I really like these Lone Star retractors because when you go under fluoro, they don't create um, any kind of artifact, which is nice um, in terms of visualization for the angiographic portion of the procedure. This is the en route sheet, the eight French sheet that's now directly in the common carotid artery. We're going to clamp below this. Uh, here I'm still using, for example, a vessel loop, which I haven't in years. Um, we then set up here with an eight French venous sheath in the groin. This is what the um, uh, the circuit looks like with the attached filter. Um, here, for example, you have before the carotid artery with a nice little ulcer. This is post stenting, and you have a little bit of debris that's collected in the filter at the end of the procedure. So. A very nice procedure, and um, uh, you know it, it probably takes me about let's say an hour, an hour and a half to do a carotid endarterectomy. Maybe it takes me forty-five to fifty minutes after you know having done now hundreds of these procedures to do um, a T car. It maybe takes like forty-five minutes or forty minutes to do uh, a carotid stent. So they're all kind of like in a similar amount of times. I will say that um, uh, it, the, the TCAR procedure does have a very nice cadence to it and flow, um, and it, it, it feels like uh, not stressful uh, to, to perform it once you get through how to identify the common carotid artery in that triangular space between the two heads of the SCM. All right, so let's put it all together. So, um, <clears throat> and we're going to talk now a little bit about how we decide. We're really going to focus on this idea of stroke risk. This is a very nice paper that was published. Um, uh, it's a patient level meta-analysis of some of the recent uh, um, uh, trials that compared um, transfemoral stenting to CEA. So here's EVA 3S, CREST space and ICSS. And they randomized patients that had symptomatic carotid stenosis that was either moderate or severe between 2000 and 2008, between two arms, carotid endarterectomy and carotid stenting. And what they, what they looked at then was the procedural risk of incurring a stroke using, the, using carotid endarterectomy versus stenting. What's absolutely nuts to me is that even though carotid endarterectomy is this tried and true procedure that's been around for a very long time, between 2000 and 2008, the complication rate of carotid endarterectomy fell significantly, which is, I don't know why that is. Maybe they were choosing better patients. Maybe they were having more experienced surgeons as the, as the trial went on. Um, but in the stenting group, you did not see that kind of fall, which is, oh, again, like a, a weird sort of thing because it's a much newer procedure. Um, but what I think it represents is that there are inherent sort of problems, as we talked about with transfemoral carotid angioplasty and stenting that just can't be overcome by experience, right? They're baked into the procedure itself, um, like the things that we talked about, you know, establishing a base construct if you have complex or aortic arch anatomy, crossing the lesion and protect it, and the issues regarding distal and polyp protection device. And this really is the big problem with transfemoral carotid angioplasty. And stenting. If you look, for example, at one of those studies that compared CEA to, it's a randomized control trial between CEA and transfemoral stenting, the ICSS study, um, there was three times more patients in the stenting group than the endarterectomy group that had new ischemic lesions on DWI. So that's, that's not just happenstance, right? There is a difference between those modalities in terms of uh, stroke risk. When we now look at TCAR, uh, the initial um, uh, paper that was published was the Roadster trial um, on 141 high surgical risk patients. Uh, here you see on the y-axis the percentage of outcomes, uh, and here you have all stroke versus stroke and death versus stroke, death, and MI. Um, and you can see that the stroke rate um, was uh, you know, lower than the uh, surgical arm of crest and uh, certainly the stenting arm of crest as well. Um, this extended not only to asymptomatic uh, patients, which is the majority of patients that are enrolled in these trials, but also in a significant subset of symptomatic patients, and that those results, not surprisingly, were durable uh, over the course of a year because it is a stenting procedure, and we know that transfemoral stenting results in durable results. Um, I'm not going to go over again all the data in this format, but now it's been shown in multiple studies, in multiple 
uh, retrospective registries. Um, uh, the most common of which you're going to see in this literature is the Society of Vascular Surgery Vascular Quality Initiative, so SVSVQI. And here's, a, a, for example, one study which compared um, 638 TCAR procedures versus over 10,000 transfemoral stenting uh, procedures that were enrolled um, in this uh, quality initiative database, which is a national database. And you can see here that the risks of stroke TIA, in-hospital stroke TIA death, are all higher for the transfemoral stenting group uh, compared to TCAR. This not only extends when you break it down between uh, for asymptomatic patients, but also extends to symptomatic patients as well. Uh, this is a great, I, I think, um, study that was performed a number of years ago um, using transcranial Doppler to look at emboli in the brain during the three different procedures, whether it's TCAR, carotid endarterectomy, or transfemoral stenting. And they broke the procedure down into different phases. So there's the pre-protection phase, the protection phase, and the post-protection phase. So for um, TCAR, this would be protection would be when active flow reversal was initiated. For stenting, it would be when um, the balloon angioplasty and stenting were being performed under distal protection. For CEA, it would be when the carotid artery was clamped. And you can see that for uh, TCAR in blue and for carotid endarterectomy, the rates of distal emboli as picked up by these tra transcranial Doppler were much, much lower than for transfemoral stenting with an embolic protection device in place. So again, the, 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 the nature of the neuroprotection strategy with flow reversal seems to be more robust in these procedures. This is um, a, a graphic from the company, um, again, which basically goes through their publication history uh, from Roadster, which we just uh, talked about a little bit, to um, various studies that are co collected in the VQI uh, data set. Um, that basically show that no matter how you cut it, that the stroke rate with TCAR seems to be quite low. So what are the advantages of carotid endarterectomy? The biggest one is that the plaque is completely removed from the body. There's no need for DAPT. There's very low paraprocedural stroke rate with durable results. Um, the plaque morphology really isn't that an important consideration. It doesn't matter if it's hard plaque, soft plaque, hemorrhagic plaque, you can take it out. The disadvantages is that it's certainly a bigger physiological stress in the body. It requires cross clamping, which means that you have to have, I think, some sort of circle of Willis. It doesn't mean that you can't put a shunt in, but if you have an isolated circulation for the period of time that it takes you to put the shunt in, that brain's going to be ischemic. And so I think it relatively increases the risk of the procedure when the margins are already very tight. You have certainly more nuisance complications. Like, you know, I've certainly had a number of patients that have had vocal cord palsies. They're usually transient. Sometimes if you get the greater um, auricular nerve at the top of the incision, they'll get a patch of numbness that can be very annoying that extends sort of over the jawline and onto the bottom of the ear, which people find very uncomfortable. So these are nuisance complications from a surgical perspective. From a patient perspective, they might not be so nuisance, especially if it's an asymptomatic lesion. When we talk about the advantages of transfemoral stenting, and I still think there's an important role for transfemoral stenting, the biggest one is that it's the only method that doesn't require you to have any circle of Willis, right? This can be performed completely safely on a patient with an isolated circulation. I think that has a major advantage conceptually over the other methods um, if you're in that particular situation. It's minimally invasive. There's no cross clamping. There's no nuisance complications, really. The hostility of the neck doesn't matter but it does have a higher paraprocedural stroke rate and you do need DAPT. So the higher stroke rate is likely due to navigation of the arch, crossing the lesion once unprotected, the intrinsic disadvantage of distal protection, which we know is not a very efficient protection strategy, and then cheese grating of the plate, for example, uh, of the plaque. I'll also say that if you have thick concentric calcification, stenting strategies aren't great. Right? And we're generally choosing to do carotid endarterectomies for those patients as well, so that the nature of the plaque also becomes important. TCAR is the hybrid procedure. It is minimally invasive. It has a similar stroke rate to carotid endarterectomy. It seems to be both in symptomatic and asymptomatic stenosis, although the, the literature on that is evolving. Um, it has much fewer nuisance complications, although you still can get um, a vocal cord injury by, by manipulating the vagus nerve. Again, these are often transient, but they, they can occur. Um, and then the hostile neck is, is, is less important, especially in terms of reoperation, because you're operating below where the endarterectomy would have been performed. Just remember, it's still a stent. 
You still need DAPT and all those issues that are surrounding that. So now if we go back to our patient that we talked about, so a 69 year old um, guy comes in with right-handed weakness, uh, he, he gets TPA, uh, the workup shows that he has a stroke, it's a relatively small stroke, and that he has this sort of uh, configuration we talked about, there's an ulceration, there's some hard plaque, there's some soft plaque. I'll say that the plaque, the hard plaque is not thick and concentric, it's sort of like a asymmetric uh, along the, the stenosis. He has a nice straight segment that you can get up to. Um, and um, so let's consider first CEA. So when you're looking at CA, we said the bifurcation is a little high. We talked a little bit about medialization of the internal carotid artery. This was a case where the carotid artery was medialized. If I had an AP, you would see that. The lesion length is a little long, but not prohibitive, certainly. Um, and um, he has an intact circle, so it's not it's not that bad, you know, doable, certainly. Um, when you look at transfemoral stenting, I don't like this conspicuous bend. Again, it doesn't mean that it's not doable. It is doable. We've done them before. I remember working with Tom Murata when I trained in Toronto. We do them all the time. It didn't seem to be a problem. But there's no question in my mind that it incrementally increases the risk of a procedure where the margins are already very small. I don't like the prominent soft plaque component and the ulceration because of the cheese grating phenomenon and the less than 100% efficient uh, uh, um, distal protection strategy. Um, I hate the MoMA device for whatever it's worth for those of you that probably have no exposure to it. But um, you know, for those of you who have tried it, I, I'm not even sure they're making it anymore, but it was bulky and inconvenient and difficult to use. Uh, but was a way of, of, of having flow or rest, uh, not flow reversal, but flow or rest uh, during uh, a, a transfemoral carotid angioplasty and stenting procedure. And now if you look at it from a TCAR perspective, um, you know, the distal ICA tortuosity, you know, it doesn't matter. The kink doesn't matter because all you have to do is put an 014 wire up through that. There's no distal embolic protection that's bulky to navigate all the way up there. There's no catheter to navigate all the way up there. Uh, it doesn't matter what the lesion length is and it doesn't matter what the morphology is. As long as there isn't thick concentric calcification, which I still think a stenting based approach probably isn't ideal. Um, in the current repertoire of procedures that we can choose from. Uh, you do need a clear, uh, uh, you know, access zone in the common carotid artery to puncture safely, so there can't be a ton of atheromatous disease down there. Um, and now this stenosis in the ECA, which might have proved challenging for a transfemoral stenting procedure to get your base construct up, now doesn't matter because we're going to not use this sort of to access um, our lesion. We use something called the stop short technique. You don't need a lot of purchase um, to get the micro um, uh, sheath in and, and even the larger eight French sheath in. All right. So that's what we chose for this patient is that we ended up doing TCAR for that particular patient. And that's the sort of logic that I run through. Um, so circle of Willis, plaque morphology, weigh heavily in my decision-making. Um, when I look at um, my practice over time, like I said, we do as a section now at about 100 carotids a year or so, something like that. About 90% of them are symptomatic. So again, we said my bias is that I tend to be conservative with asymptomatic carotid disease. We crossed the, um, my 100th TCAR um, in 2020. Uh, I think now as a section, we're sort of like in the 200 to 250 range. I hired a partner here because I needed help. <laughs> and so that's, these are just my volumes, but you know, uh, his, his, his volumes make up the difference. Um, um, what, what I will say is that if you look at this graphic is that when I started my practice in 2012, I was essentially being referred patients for transfemoral stenting, right? The vascular surgeons didn't want to operate on some carotid and they referred me a patient for transfemoral stenting. This is before the pivotal stroke trial. So we didn't really have access to tons of patients with symptomatic carotid disease because they weren't coming through that channel. And even before I got into TCAR, my transfemoral stenting rate was going down and my endarterectomy rate was going up. I trained as a neuro, I'm a, like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a small open, big endo, surgeon, right? Because everybody has like, everyone says dual trained, but you know, we have different combinations of the duality of that training, right? So I happen to perform all three of the procedures uh, for carotid revascularization at high volumes. Um, but there's no question that in my hands, even before TCAR, I was noticing that my end art rates at the, the slow level that I was doing, I was getting better results often than with transfemoral stenting. And so naturally my endarterectomy rate went up and my transfemoral stenting rate went down. 
Then when we adopted TCAR, which was back in 2016, I thought it was like the solution for everything, right? And so we were doing a lot of it. And then, you know, it's not, right? Because you run into issues with, you know, maybe you shouldn't be stenting these, these heavily calcified concentric lesions. Maybe you shouldn't, you should be looking closer at the circle of Willis to make sure that there is efficient flow reversal because the circle of Willis determines how efficient the flow reversal strategy is going to be. And where we ended up in 2021 was that 40% of my practice was CEA, uh, 40% was TCAR, and 20% was transfemoral stenting. And if we were to fast forward to today uh, in 2023, what I would be is 50% endarterectomy, 40% TCAR, and 10% transfemoral stenting. And I think that's going to probably hold true uh, for a while. Um, yeah. And again, the major decision makers are the nature of the plaque, really that heavily calcified concentric calcification and the status of the circle of Willis. All right, we're going to end with a look into the future. So I really consider uh, TCAR as what I would call platform technology, right? It, it, especially if you're a neurovascular specialist, it's not hard to imagine that there are other applications for the use of a eight French sheath in someone's common carotid artery coupled with a, a robust proximal protection strategy. Our infolded fellow, this is now a few years ago, she's actually a chief resident. We'll be doing her uh, postgraduate year of endovascular fellowship with Amon Patel at MGH. Um, you know, we started to do a number of difficult to access uh, strokes using this procedure. So we would take the patient to the lab. We would do an open carotid exposure. I would put the trans, I would put the en route sheath in uh, the neck and we would perform our thrombectomy uh, through that particular uh, sheath. And we, we had really good results. We then helped the company uh, modify the en route sheath uh, so that it was better designed for stroke. In particular, there's a diaphragm that's very annoying. So if you put the, you know, if you have a stroke and there's a clot at the end of an aspiration catheter and you pull it through the diaphragm, the stroke, the, the, the clot will just go up into the head. So you have to do like a little bit of fidgeting to get the clot out in that situation. Doable, but not ideal. So for, for example, in particular, we got rid of that diaphragm and now we have a standard Y connector on it. We got rid of this thing called a foot plate. So we can put this all the way up into the distal ICA if we want to. Um, and this study is called night one and is really meant for patients that have prohibitive vascular access from a transfemoral route. Uh, there's five uh, centers that are uh, enrolling. We have 11 patients. We just closed the feasibility study and we're looking at the results and hopefully they'll be um, presented at this year's international stroke conference. So this is one example of uh, using essentially the TCAR platform for acute stroke intervention. You can see this just, you know, ridiculous, you know, petrous, cavernous, atherosclerotic, dissecting aneurysm. There's probably plaque. If you could like walk through this with Vitor Pereira's magic camera and look at the lumen, it's probably jagged and irregular and all kinds of, you know, craziness. And so, you know, maybe there's a risk of having a stroke by manipulating this vessel. Maybe there isn't. I don't know. We ended up treating this with flow diverters, um, uh, but using full flow reversal for the hour it took to do all these particular interventions and to get this treated. And I think there's advantage to that. Uh, often when you have these giant cavernous aneurysms, their, their access issues are awful, right? They often have very difficult arches. It's very difficult to establish a base construct. And still with flow diversion, you do need some degree of stability. This affords you amazing stability and the advantage of proximal protection if you want. Now, when we do ICAD cases of the terminal ICA, we only do this. We've completely abandoned a transfemoral route. We essentially only do this now um, through uh, a transfemoral um, or through um, the, the direct carotid access because it avoids manipulation of the arch and it gives you some degree of, uh, of flow protection uh, during the ICAD procedure. Um, and again, all these things, once you get the exposure down, which takes about 10 cases, 15 cases, it doesn't take very long at all, right? We're talking about, you know, 10 minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes. It's not like a big deal. So it's really not that much different. And the incision is very small over the clavicle and patients seem to tolerate it well. So from a neurovascular point of view, um, specialist, I think that there's other reasons beyond carotid revascularization. So I want to learn about this technology and to just start thinking about how to adopt it. So that's what we talked about. And um, I really, appreciate the opportunity for being invited to talk. Thanks again, Dr. Matsuk, for that 
wonderful talk. I'm going to open up the field for questions. Yeah, I just want to add that that was beautiful, you know, really lucid uh, talk. And I, I loved listening to it. And there's some real pearls in there for especially for people uh, starting out in this and, and uh, hope, hopefully they were paying attention to them. Um, I see Steve's hand is up. Steve, why don't you go? Uh, thanks, Charles. That was an amazing talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, a, a really thorough coverage of both the indications and and how you choose to uh, which way you revascularize. Um, we've moved in our department to um, various degrees of enthusiasm for uh, TCAR um, and um, the uh, proponents. Um, I guess have the positivity that that you have and the the people speaking against it. Um, point to transradial carotid uh, stenting uh, and sort of the minimally invasive nature of that. I just wondered if you had any comment on um, with our radial techniques that we have now, um, it's hard to argue a little, uh, you know, incision in the wrist. Do you have any comment on transradial versus uh, TCAR? Yeah, again, I think I have no particular, um, you, you know, I think all, all techniques are appropriate. And I think that some techniques, depending on the individual patient and their circumstances, are going to be, you know, better suited for one method than another. And I think that a patient, that a proceduralist experience and an institution's experience with a particular technique is going to be relevant. Um, the, 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 the issue with the transradial approach, um, as I see it, are twofold. Um, you know, one is that, um, you know, uh, you're probably aware of some papers that have shown that even for diagnostic catheter angiography, and, we, and we, we've completely migrated to transradial approaches for diagnostic catheter angiography, for example, over the last, I don't know, four or five years now, that th there is, there is, I think our complication rate is very low, but when you're dragging, you know, the Simmons II catheter, uh, you know, across the arch, um, there, there are more DWI hits, and I think that's been shown now in multiple papers over time. And so you're, you're performing a procedure where you're trying to prevent stroke, but you're going to do like potentially a more at-risk kind of maneuver to get your catheter system up there. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the major advantage of TCAR uh, relative to, um, uh, to transfemoral stenting or transradial stenting is the neuroprotection strategy, right? And so the, the distal embolic protection strategy is not a good one, right? It is not an efficient strategy. You still have to cross the lesion unprotected. You still have all the issues with landing it in a straight segment, retrieving it without bumping the device, and just the inherent fact that the distal embolic protection strategy isn't as good, right? Now, depending on patient factors, and maybe they have like a 15% ejection factor and they've had like their third stroke and, you know, you don't want to put them to sleep. And it, right? every patient's going to have their own individual calculus as to like what is an optimal procedure. And like I said, we haven't abandoned transfemoral stenting by any, by any means. Um, um, but I think for most patients that have an intact circle and you're going to do a stenting procedure, we have found sort of significant advantage to doing TCAR. It's not without complication, but I, in my opinion, it does have in our hands um, reduced complication that is consistent with what is published in the imperfect literature. I'm just gonna make an added comment in your defense, Stephen, or in def defense of that position is that, um, you know, the, fir the first thing is that the S SV as a VQI is a retrospective, um, um, essentially, uh, uh, database where surgeons self-report, right, complications, procedural self-report complications. I mean, we know that that's a recipe for not great data, right? But it is hard to argue with the numbers, right? And it is hard when you see data and that resonates with my own personal experience after, you know, hundreds and hundreds of carotid revascularizations. Um, you know, I tend, I tend to believe it because it's true in my shop, in my hands. Now, if you have somebody like Cam, who's been doing this a long time and as a master of his trade, you know, and you've learned a lot of things along the way. And I'm not, I'm not joking, right? Like I think we, we tend to minimize procedural experience, you know, in these types of things. But if you're doing a high volume procedure a lot, you're going to get good at it and you're going to learn the different nuances that keep you safe. 
And so I think that when I talk about this stuff to interventional neurologists, like at SVIN, there's often this reaction, like, well, I've never had a complication. It's like, well, okay, you know, I have. So there you go. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a great comment. For, for those that are um, starting out, uh, if you could kind of summarize your ideal uh, TCAR patient who uh, you know, comes into the hospital with a stroke, uh, if, if uh, it was your colleagues, junior colleagues, uh, you know, first TCAR, what does that patient look like? Skinny neck? Uh, you know, what, what does that look like for someone who's starting out? Where would you start? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so the f first and foremost, like, you know, we talked about at the beginning, you want a symptomatic patient, right? So, you know, let's, if, if you can, I think I was given the advice, you know, in your first 10 patients, you want them to do well because how well patients do in your first 10 patients is going to be a reflection for the referring procedure, you know, providers. And I think my first 10 cases were just like a series of like, you know, just monstrosities that, you know, I would have trouble tackling today. <laughs> so, you know, it just, you know, it's kind of like a silly comment, but having said that, I think that, you know, personally, I would advise, it's the advice that I got um, from a vascular surgeon um, in Toronto that I thought highly of is that just stay away from asymptomatic carotid disease. Let's make sure that there's a symptomatic patient. So if there's a stroke, at least it's a stroke in a patient that's had a stroke, not a patient that was like walking around and fine at home. Um, the second thing is, yeah, I think that if you have a, a skinny patient with a long common carotid artery before the bifurcation, um, that is probably the ideal first patient. Um, when you get started, it's often like in transfemoral stenting, um, nice to put the micro sheath and micro guide wire in the external carotid artery. So if you have free of disease in the external carotid artery, if the disease doesn't involve the common carotid artery, but is really restricted to the ICA. I think as you learn the nuances of how to get the sheath in safely and comfortably, uh, that is a particular advantage as well, because you can get more uh, stability with more purchase of your uh, wire system in the external carotid artery. So I would start with that. Um, and then just take your time. You know, there's this, this idea that when you're, when you're doing um, flow reversal, that you have to be quick. It's actually quite the opposite. I tend to be quick as a proceduralist, just because it's my nature, I'm kind of like hyper and I just want to, you know, it's just my, you know, somebody told me that you can't, everybody walks at their own rate, right? You have like a natural pace. And if you force a, a slow person to walk fast, it's not good. And if you force a fast person to walk slow, it's not good, right? So you want to walk at your pace, um, but you shouldn't feel rushed by the flow reversal. So I'll use SSCPs and EEG to monitor for any kind of ischemic changes, do it under a general anesthetic, not awake when you get started, although it's totally reasonable to do these um, awake and we have. Um, and, and just take your time and trust the electrophysiology. Um, again, for some of those complex aneurysm cases, we've had the flow reversal going for an hour and the patients wake up like, like nothing happened. Um, so there's no rush to the procedure, you know, there's no rush to the procedure or trying to limit the amount of flow reversal time. Uh, it's extremely rare if you pre-select patients that on cross-sectional imaging have a circle of Willis of some sort, an NACOM, APCOM, that there's going to be intolerance, right? And when we compare our series internally to vascular surgery groups that really don't look at the circle of Willis and with the type of detail that we do, their risks of intolerance of flow reversal, whether it's with awake patients or with electrophysiology is much higher than in our shop. And I think it's because they're doing patients that have incomplete circles, uh, you know, or more incomplete circles. And we just avoid all that because I'm like, well, if that's the case, then we're going to just do a transfemoral stent right? I'm not going to want to deal with all that. So that, that, that the circle of Willis and its integrity, I think, is something to pay a lot of attention to in carotid revascularization in general. Um, I didn't learn it from my transfemoral stenting mentors, because in transfemoral stenting, it doesn't matter, right? Dr. Patel, I see you have your hands up. Hey, thanks. Great presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I, I'm the uh, camp of the TCAR uh, advocate. <laughs> here um but uh i um wanted to just you know um ask just a little few technical details i'm excited that you mentioned the night study at the end because i think you know that it may be the future of some of these stroke intervention procedures um and just a quick technical question before i get into some other questions like um 
would you still do a cut down or is there an opportunity there uh, for percutaneous access for direct carotid? And could you do that and then do the cut down closure later? I'm just thinking of uh, logistics. You're in the middle of the night, you know, you might not be able to get the OR team and the IR team there in a timely fashion, 2 a.m. stroke comes in. Just trying to figure out, you know, what logistics in the future might be applicable, and you know, you've you've helped them design a special type of sheath for this. Is there any thought about designing a special sheath set up for a percutaneous, much more rapid access? Yeah, there are there are great questions, right? So, and comments um, with regard to you know acute stroke intervention. Um, it, my, my answer is like a little bit long and I'm going to try to be, you know, sensitive to time. We, we published in, a, I think, 2020, Brandon Cord, who's now at UC Davis, was our fellow at the time. And this was sort of like in the 2018-19 era where the um, navigability of the aspiration catheters was changing, right? We were sort of like moving from salumbra, grapple hook type stuff to get the catheters to the face to catheters that can actually get where they need to go pretty easily over a wire. And... Um, and um, during that sort of transitional time, um, we were frustrated by cases where we were still having a lot of challenges in difficult arch anatomy getting up safely. And the procedures were taking a lot of time, right? So you'd spend like 40 minutes um, just trying to get up to the clot. And then you get up to the clot, you do a nice pull with an aspiration catheter and the clot comes out and you're like, darn it, you know, like I wish I could have done this so much faster. And so we actually migrated before transradial um, interventions were popularized to uh, when, when we saw difficult arch anatomy or we experienced difficult arch anatomy and we're having trouble sort of like getting up into the common carotid arteries um, over, let's say, a 15 minute period, we would abandon that approach, intubate the patient and do a direct carotid puncture using a six French bright tip sheath, and then do our aspirations through that. And there's no question that if you compare patients that had direct carotid percutaneous carotid access, we published this in the Journal of Neurosurgery um, in, in about that time frame, 2020, maybe. Um, if, 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 if you compare it to patients where you just gave up, right? You said like, I can't get up. We're just going to abandon the procedure. There's no question the patients did much, much, much better if you can get the clot out. Not surprising, right? We did have one patient though that died three days after successful, successful thrombectomy of um, a carotid blowout, right? And it was probably failure of an angioseal device. We'd have about half our patients who used manual pressure, about half our patients used an angioseal device and she died, right? She died. For those people that don't know, the reason you die when you have a neck hematoma isn't so much the neck hematoma compressing the airway, but it incites edema inside the airway. And so once that edema starts, it's then very difficult to, to gain control of that airway and patients will just as asphyxiate, right? It's awful. So that was really the impetus for moving away from direct carotid puncture from a percutaneous fashion to either doing transradial or doing this night one procedure, which we started with the en route sheath but that has its own issues. And we migrated to um, an open carotid access. We have the advantage that, you know, we have these hybrid rooms that were available emergently. We can use the vascular surgery rooms. We'll often use the Zigo on a uni plane for these procedures in the middle of the night. And um, again, once you get comfortable with the exposure, and I think you guys have, you know, over a hundred T cars under your belt. So you're very familiar with the exposure. Um, it is not a big deal to take a patient, a stroke patient to the lab and do a little cut down and, and gain access quickly. I'm going to preface this with something that's controversial, that we have a paper under review in neurosurgery. And I'll, I'll try to keep this under a minute. <laughs> but, you know, um, um, when, when the, uh, you know, the pivotal trials in stroke care were published in 2015, the primary efficacy endpoint for those was ticky 2 b 3 revascularization. Cam McDougall will remember the Mercy device, right? And the Mercy trials that predate the foundational trials. Successful revascularization in those trials was not defined by ticky 2 bc right? Which is already like not complete, complete revascularization. It was defined as any revascularization, so partial or complete. So their primary efficacy outpoints were ticky 2 a right, to C. That was, that was considered technically successful. And the Mercy trial showed 70, 75% of people attained that primary efficacy outpoint. The problem was that it didn't translate to clinical outcome, right? So it was really the IMS investigators, like if IMS3 fame, that changed it uh, to ticky 2 b 3 
And that's a much more useful metric of a mechanical thrombectomy, um, of success after a mechanical thrombectomy, because now that correlates with better patient outcomes, right? It's the traditional three-month MRS zero to two good functional outcome. Now there's evidence that TICI 2 C to 3 is actually a better metric. Why is it a better metric of successful reperfusion? Because those patients do a little bit better at three months, right? Osama Zadok comes along and looks at the NASA registry, which was like a big uh, post-approval solitaire registry, and defined this thing called first pass effect. So what, what is first pass effect? He builds on this concept that not only is it sufficient to have complete revascularization, right? So TICI 2 C to 3, but it should also be completed in one pass. Why should it be completed in one pass? Because if you take two passes, right, patients don't do as well in terms of good functional outcome at three months. So now that's a better proxy for a mechanical thrombectomy procedure. The paper we have under review in neurosurgery right now talks about a new metric we call FPE30. If you look at patients that have first pass success, right? So these are patients that have uh, complete revascularization, ticky 2 c to 3 um, um, after one pass of a mechanical thrombectomy device. We show that in a large international data set, we show that patients do better if you perform that procedure quickly, right, of, of, of arterial puncture to revascularization. So let's say in 10 minutes, compared to 30 minutes or one hour. So now we add the wrinkle of, not only is it important to have complete revascularization, not only is it important to achieve it in one pass, but that pass has to be quick in terms of intravascular time with devices. That sets the stage up for procedures like alternative access through an open carotid exposure, because all those things control for time from presentation right, to um, groin puncture. Consistently, what's been shown is procedure time. It's a vulnerable time for our patients where if you don't get the blood vessel open, patients probably do worse. And if you take too long, patients do worse than if you took a short period of time, the intravascular time, the procedure time. Once you add that wrinkle and you think it's becoming, it conceptually you decide that that's important because it translates to better potential patient outcomes down the road. Now things that have a short procedure time become more important than how long it took you to get to the procedure, you know, for a majority of patients. And I think the field's not quite there yet, but that's where I'm certainly trying to push it. And now procedures like the TCAR procedure, the night one procedure, become much more relevant because the intravascular time is really 10 minutes, right? It takes a very short amount of time to go from sheath in to aspiration catheter out. And then because we're doing these with flow reversal, you can imagine that there's potentially less embolic phenomenon and you know breaking up of the clot as you pull it out. So I think it has other advantages. You can also use shorter aspiration catheters, right? These shorter aspiration catheters allow you to have more suction sort of applied at the face of the clot, more power of aspiration. Um, does that improve first pass effect, right? Or first pass success. So I, I think that, again, this technology is going to be iterated over time and, you know, we're going to see where it goes. That was a long answer to a no, straightforward that a question. <laughs> no, that was a great answer because I'm, uh, you know, um, I'm really excited about that platform for a lot of inter carotid interventions. You know, you'd mentioned obviously treating aneurysms, but I think if you, look at it for the future, if you can get um, the facility to do it appropriately. But I also think to your point, it's also gonna um, isolate who gets to do these procedures if they're trying to be more efficacious because a surgeon's gonna wanna be able to do them more comfortably than someone who's just a radiologist or a neurologist, et cetera. So there's a kind of a, a push pull there, I think. I think at the moment, but I think that the system will eventually become percutaneous, right? That the nut to crack in the percutaneous game is closure. Yeah. Right? You need a closure device that's like essentially 100% effective. It'll come, right? It'll come. Thank you. It'll, de it'll democratize the field, yeah. Opened up some really uh, interesting questions there and I would love to talk more. We've gone a fair bit over time already and I really appreciate you uh, um, humoring us and staying with us to answer all those questions. Uh, really enjoyed spending the time with you, Charles.